I believe that people need dramatic examples to shake them from their apathy. This is taken directly from one of my favorite movies, Batman Begins, where Bruce Wayne explains to Alfred. Alfred says, why bats, Mr. Wayne? He says, because bats frighten me and it's time my enemies shared my dread. And then he says, as a man, I can be ignored. I can be destroyed, but as an idea, as a symbol, I can go on forever. Welcome to Too Legitimate to Quit, instantly actionable small business strategies with a pop culture spin. I am your host, Annie P. Ruggles, and my guest today is the brilliant Paul Ross. For over 30 years, Paul Ross has been featured in leading media outlets, including BBC, Fox, CNN, NBC, Huffington Post, Uprox, Rolling Stone, and more. His speeches and trainings have motivated tens of thousands to discover their power to design their own results through the power of persuasion and language. Paul, thank you so much for being on the show. What do small businesses need to focus on this week? I think it's the same thing they should focus on every week, if I can be so bold, and that is the following. Yes, you may. What state of mind, what state of consciousness do they need to build into themselves so they're ready to meet the challenges of business, the challenges of entrepreneurship, the challenges of having a team and a staff? I teach states of consciousness. Being a hypnotist for 30 years, I understand that we go through altered states of mind all the time. By altered states, I don't necessarily mean taking LSD or ayahuasca or the rest of it. I mean from one state to the next. How I mean, you... if that's your kink, why not? <laughs> well, I don't think it's particularly useful. But how do you build in a state <laughs> that's willing and gracefully actually acknowledges and accepts and blesses the inherent ups and downs of running a business, the confusion, the uncertainty, the setbacks that will come with it, and create a state where you have informed enthusiasm and intelligent motivation so that you can see what challenges are coming up, but you don't identify with the challenges as being who you are. To gain distance from negative patterns of thinking and to recognize challenges without making it part of your identity is not a skill that's taught. But when you learn that skill, it enables you to take on a tremendous amount of the non-technical sides of your business. In any business, there's the technical side, and then there's the mindset. I consider myself a champion at teaching sales, but a world master at mindset because I come from an unusual background that you don't know because I didn't tell you about it because I like to spring it on my <laughs> hosts in the I middle love of the it. show. Do it. I'm a former dating guru, and I used to take guys who are in their 30s, 40s, and 50s who couldn't get a date and teach them how to get past all of their shame, all of their re resentment, their envy, their anger, their confusion, their frustration, get them out of those states of mind into states first of neutrality. It's too big a leap to go from that kind of pain to being positive. You first have to go mm -hmm. to neutral and from neutral to build in a realistically positive attitude. Not that it's all going to go right. It's all going to go right. I am a champion. I'm a master because we know business is not a straight line progress is not a straight line it's like boom no boom, boom boom we know that and just when you think you're up you wind up going down and then you think you're gonna stick down and you go back up but you know i love the way that you put this before you use this combination of acknowledge and accept the ups and downs right it's not just acknowledge them and it's not just accept them it's both. And I think that's so critical. We have to be aware of what's going on and honor it in a way in order to get through it. And let's take it a step further. Let's bless it. Let's bless mm. it. So I acknowledge it. I'm aware of it and I bless it. So mm. I have an affirmation every morning, which is I am blessed to face my challenges in my life. 
I am blessed to joyously, creatively, courageously, consistently face my challenges in my life. I am blessed to joyously, creatively, courageously conquer my challenges in my life. That's gorgeous. And again, I love that combination. I love the way that you bring concepts together, creativity, courage, and consistency. How unbelievably key all three of those things are at every phase of business, every phase. And there's another key word in there. I am blessed to joyously. What's the difference mm. between saying I'm blessed to have my challenges in my life and I am blessed to joyously have my challenges in my life? In NLP, Neuro Linguistic Programming, which is one of my core disciplines, as we know, this is called an adverb presupposition to say joyously accept, joyously have implies that yes, you're going to have it. Adverbs supercharge anything and make them even more optimum. I don't like the word positive. Positive implies law of attraction. Just think about what you want. Your vibration will draw it to you, which I think is nonsense. Did the children who are murdered and slaughtered by Hitler put out that negative vibration asking themselves to be murdered? People who believe in that stuff don't recognize the problem and the horror of actual evil in the world. Instead, I like to think of optimum. What is the optimum belief that will create the neural pathways in your mind because altering language alters the neural nets in your brain. So what are the optimum beliefs that will create the opening of the neural nets you need to take on what you need to take on? Mm. I love, love, love. And one of the things, so you and I actually met because I was lucky enough to attend a training that you were doing. And I considered myself a word nerd and then i met paul like <laughs> oh the way that you explain the potency and value of stuff like adverbs just makes me so happy paul it does because it's those words that really unlock the brain and open up the brain and so you know i love how you're talking about creating belief fortifying belief through language for people that are not uh what if they're new to the idea of nlp or linguistics in general where did that love originate and and when did you realize that words were so powerful well i recognized it when i was a six seven year old kid at the dinner table having to debate and argue with siblings who are eight seven 10, 13 years older than I was. So I needed to be quick on my feet verbally. And my mother also encouraged me. My father and mother gave me a dangerous permission to give any child. Mm. The dangerous permission they gave me was to think individually, to take any line of thinking and follow it no matter how extreme to its logical conclusion. We were never punished for thinking, for talking back along certain lines. Uh, if we sassed about a behavior we weren't supposed to be doing, we were punished. But I remember at the dinner table, just to tweak my mom's nose, I would say, mommy, I'm a communist. This is like <laughs> seven years old, like six, seven years old. And my mother would say, okay, Paul, what does a communist believe? And I'd say, I don't know. She'd say, oh, that's not acceptable. So here's what's going to happen tomorrow. By dinner time, you're going to have a book report on communism. If it's a good book report, you get a silver dollar. If it's a bad book report, then you can't go outside and play for a day. And you shouldn't refer to yourself as a communist anymore if you can't get a good book report. Well, no, she didn't That's say awesome. that. All right, we're Jewish. We were Jewish. I would say, Mom, I'm a Christian. And she would go, okay, what's a Christian believe? Yeah. And so we were, and my mother also said to me, here, let me back up. Being Jewish, we always had books in the house. We didn't have a lot of money, but we always had money for encyclopedias. And I would just sit there and read the encyclopedia just for fun. And I loved grammar school. I loved diagramming sentences. That, oh. that I, I love doing it. I just love semantics and language. If people really understood the power of words to change, even subtle things, to create change in themselves and other people. They'd go bananas. It really is a passion of mine. Um, I told my probably soon-to-be ex-girlfriend that I loved my work, 
more than I did her. I just said, look, <laughs> I love you, but my work is my ultimate passion, is my calling. It's what I'm meant to do. Right? My life, my love in the say, lady is the sea, right? What song is my that? Brandy. My, my love, love and my lady, lady is, is the sea. sea. There we go. Yep. Your life, your love, and your lady is NLP. No, that's well, your NLP first. is not the be all <laughs> and the end all of what I do. I no. also do hypnosis. I do other kinds of healing work. And this is something that people don't get leaned into in my biography is that I am a healer. I do a lot of healing work and it's profoundly, profoundly fulfilling for me. Mm. I love how you're combining all of these different elements. Again, I love how you combine things. And you were talking before about working with single men, building up their confidence and how they're presenting themselves in, in the dating space. And that is the most logical segue to sales to me I've ever heard in my life. Because what is that no. if not learning how to position and sell yourself with confidence in any situation that makes complete right. sense. But the mindset piece, that's the part that requires the healing. That's the part that requires getting in, figuring out what is sort of festering or blocked inside you and right. your business and, and digging and in I there. I think what's missing in most mindset training, first of all, what makes my mindset training unique is that I'm coming from outside the field. You can't see the gaps and, and the mistakes and the errors and incompleteness in a field if you're coming from inside that field. It takes an outsider's view. Now, to be sure, an outsider has some smarts. So I was able to look at business and go, wait, wait, what they're training here about mindset, it's lacking because it's not telling people how to get past what I call the Hanukkah robot phenomenon. Please tell me what that is. I know. So I'm creating curiosity. When I was, <laughs> uh, what's 1966? So I was eight years old. Now I had this habit. I'd like to break my little brother Stevie's toys. It's just what I like to do. And he's still traumatized. He's finally over the trauma. You know, he forgives me for it. I, I love my family. I, I love him to tears. So my sister, Anita, bought him a toy robot for Hanukkah. Now, back then, toy robots could do three things. You could push a button, make them go forward, push a button, make them go backwards, push a button to make their the light bulbs in their eyes blink. Now, being what they call in the diagnostic service manual, the actual medical manual for psychiatrists and psychologists, category one, access two, I believe, subpart three, a schmuck. <laughs> being a schmuck <laughs> you can tell I've told that joke before. I decided. <laughs> well, it worked. Uh, I decided that I was going to break that toy. And so I, I pressed forward and backwards at the same time. The robot's butt began to smoke as the blue wiring uh, melted. It shook uncontrollably and it fell over. So the robot had this internal <laughs> oh. conflict. And I don't think all this positive thinking, all and don't get me wrong, I write down my goals, I do visualize, I do affirmations. But that's because I've, I've have figured out how to take the stuff that's telling me, no, you can't do it, and to depotentiate it, as we say in hypnosis, how to rob it of a great deal of its power. So the conflict comes up, but it's not as strong. If, as you're listening to me, you've ever thought that you're fighting yourself, that the process of change or progress feels exhausting, this is how, not why. I don't care why it evolved or who, how you picked up the habit. This is how you maintain it. And what I found, I learned this through looking at my dating students. I would say, how many here have ever made a mistake with a woman? Really screwed it up at the last minute. Maybe you could see she was attracted to you, but you were too scared to kiss her, whatever. Every hand in a room of 50 people would go up. I said, now keep your, oh, hand, yeah. keep your hand up if you dwelt on that mistake at least 100 times. Every hand stays oh, up. Yeah. Keep your hand up if you dwelt on that 500 times. Every hand stays up. Keep your hand up if you think about this mistake when you're driving. Every hand stays up. How about <laughs> when you're eating? Every hand stays up. I said, put your hands down. Now, listen to me. Pay attention, audience, because here's the crucial bit. I'm going to give you a universal law of the brain that I just made up. Here, There's two of them, two laws. First of all, in any struggle between the conscious mind and the unconscious mind, the unconscious is going to win. 
That's just how it works. Second, your brain or your mind, I use them interchangeably, doesn't matter. Your brain cannot tell the difference between what you're dwelling on over and over and over and over and what you're programming it to do. So if you have 10,000 repetitions of dwelling on a mistake, looking at what you did wrong, you're programming that behavior back into your brain. Not because you're this identity of a thing called a self-sabotager or you lack some mysterious fluid called self-esteem and you're five quarts low and you need a coach to pour some into your head. It's simply because you have a, can I curse on your show? Oh, hell yes. Please do. You have a shit learning strategy. Your shit learning strategy in an effort to learn from your mistakes because no one's ever taught you how to do it. You're programming them right back in. And so I had to stop and think, how can I stop this? How can I come up with some novel ways of getting students to look at what they're doing, recognize what they did right, and then ask themselves the questions they need to learn how to correct the behavior and stay realistically motivated. Mm, realistically motivated. Oof. Oof. Because that's where expectation creeps in and stuff when we're not realistically right. motivated. And we listen that to crappy advice, like just push through the pain. Here's the problem with pushing through pain. When you push through pain, first of all, pain distorts your perception and drives your behavior distort in a less than useful way. Second, when you're pushing through pain, it's exhausting, like pushing that huge rock in front of you. And third, when you push through pain, rapport becomes deadly. Rapport can actually be dangerous when you're in pain because when you're in a lot of pain, fear, doubt, desperation, despair, whatever it is, when you're in rapport with your client and your prospect, they feel what you feel. They're going to suddenly start feeling de despair, pain, hopelessness, and they're going to think it's because of you. They're, they're, they're not yeah. They're going to think they can't trust you. You don't want to be associated with that hot mess. Ugh. So rapport is actually counter sale. Rapport will ruin your sale unless you're in the right frame of mind. True. And so seeing these connections between rapport and state of mind of what works, works, I can see this where no one else can because my mother taught me again to be an iconoclast, to take conventional wisdom and challenge it and to say, what if what everyone is saying is not true or is incomplete? She told me the story of the emperor's clothes. You know the story about the emperor the emperor is naked. Yeah. The crazy emperor decided that his birthday suit would be a beautiful set of clothes. And he ordered everyone to watch him parade. And no one was, uh, <laughs> had the balls to yell, the emperor is naked. And the little boy who saw with innocent, clear eyes yelled out, the emperor is naked. And he's got a tiny wiener, too. <laughs> <laughs> That's my addition into the story. I love it. I, you know, I think it's so interesting Going back to your mom, that idea of take any stance you want, but be ready to defend it. Like if you're going to claim it, claim it to the end. And, and the way that you said that, like, we were encouraged as kids to defend things to the end, to follow thoughts to the end, to explore. Yeah. And I think that in business is so critical because it's in that deep exploration and it's in those rabbit holes, as long as we don't get stuck in them, that we learn what differentiates us from our surroundings. Yeah. Yep. And so courage. Ha and I also say, look, you have to have compassion for yourself. I practice meditation. I try to do it every day. Compassion gives us the courage to look with clarity. So cultivating compassion for ourselves is required to have the clarity to see what's going on in, in our business. So com cultivating compassion gives us the courage to see with clarity where we need to go. If you're not cultivating compassion for yourself through a meditation practice, I'm not religious, but if you're religious through a prayer practice, then, then you're spinning your wheels or you're making the, the challenge of seeing what you need to learn a lot more difficult. And of course, have a mentor, have mentorship, have someone oh, yes. who's been where you've been, take you by the hand. I have two mentors. I have about 70. 70? <laughs> yeah. I pick them up like coupons. I'm like, you, come on, get in the car. <laughs> but I love that you 
put, you know, one of the things that I hear over and over and over and over is if I can just get clear, then this will get easier. And and what I love about what you're saying is no, no, courage begets clarity. Courage begets clarity, not the other way around. It's not when I get clear on something, I can be braver, bolder, stronger. It's be braver, bolder, stronger in order to achieve clarity. Am I hearing you right on that? Almost. What I'm saying is compassion. Cultivating compassion for yourself will give you the courage to have the clarity because often we don't look because we beat ourselves up or we have unnecessary sorrow or despair. One of the things I say every day, because I'm by nature a depressed person, I am not a happy person by nature. I have to practice being happy every day. Me too. Me too. So one of the things I say is I want to talk, Annie, about surrender and embrace. I have a practice of surrendering and embracing. So I say I surrender my right to despair and telling myself tales of impossibility and destructively comparing myself to others. And I embrace my practice of compassion for myself, for blessing the success of those further along the path and successfully seeking out their mentorship and guidance. Mm. So I have a practice of surrender and embrace. I'm working on a course on this. I think I'm gonna call it the radical art of unbleeping yourself how to get the hell out of your own way and practically manifest what it is you desire. Mm -hmm. If it's not based on observable principles, look, the universe, whatever that means, is not your private wish room well. Sorry, all you law of (laughs) attraction people. It doesn't all exist to make sure you get your (laughs) ideal partner that brand new rolls and lose the last five pounds of fat off your ass. That's not why it's here. (laughs) What? That's not the purpose of the And the law of attraction, I have to bash it a bit. It's so narcissistic. I've been to these seminars where the guys talk about the law of attraction. They show their three homes and the Bahamas and Tahiti. But And everyone's talking about what they want to attract, $5 million next year, their own home and whatever. Not a one of them says, I would like to bring clean drinking water to 2 billion people in this world who don't have it. It's all completely self-centered, completely narcissistic. It's the old idea, the old astronomical idea that was that everything revolved around the earth. Well, these people believe everything revolves around them. It's mm-hmm. the ultimate ontological, did I say ontological? It's the ultimate metaphysical narcissism and, and it disturbs mm-hmm. me. Mm. And then along with that is the sick idea that everything happens for a reason and we create everything that happens in their own reality, in our reality. I think there's a huge amount of delusion on the path to self-development and the path to success. And you better have a bullshit detector and be Mm. able to, that's the other thing that I learned. I learned how to critically think and say, wait a minute, what are the count? For examples to this. What is the level of evidence that they're presenting to me? And this is what I love what I do because I'm not presenting anything I do as science. I speak authoritatively, but I also will say this is my model. It's only my map. It's subject to error. I'm sure it's riddled with error. It's incomplete and it's open-ended for other people to come along and improve it. Mm. It's only a map. It's not science. There's no science. I think there may be some science to suggest that changing your wording actually opens new neural nets in your brain. I mm-hmm. think there is some science there, but I'm not relying on that. But it's not true with the capital T. Yes, totally, completely. Now, I'm going to take us wildly in a different direction now. Do it. Wildly. Wildly. Do it. We're talking about reality and our relationship with reality and we're talking about you know narcissism and altruism and showing up and making a difference and being confident and you are a huge fan of all things superhero so paul yep what on earth does any of this linguistic or sales or mindset or altruism or law of attraction oh i see harley quinn over there i see batman over there he's showing me his wall y'all i am impressed paul what the heck does any I of have this justice league i love it talk to me about justice league what does any of this have to do with the justice league <laughs> 
I think people need heroic examples to shock them out of their apathy and their fixed patterns of thinking. Mm. So when I show up, for example, for my dating students, I show up 10 times larger than life. I radiate not just confidence, but incre incredible arrogance and even a little vulgarity. I won't even tell you the names I call myself. I do it under a different identity, a different name, because I like to keep <laughs> the brands separated one from the other. You see, and so I believe that people need dramatic examples to shake them from their apathy. This is taken directly from one of my favorite movies, Batman Begins, where Bruce Wayne Ooh. explains to Alfred. Alfred says, why bats, Mr. Wayne, uh, Mr. Uh, Sir, Master Wayne? He says, because bats frighten me and it's time my enemies shared my dread. And then he says, as a man. I can be ignored. I can be destroyed. But as an idea, as a symbol. I can go on forever. And people need those dramatic examples. They need the symbols. They need, I think superheroes are the modern equivalent of the ancient gods. They represent icons for who we want to be. And if you want to get into things mm. like ritual magic, they. my girlfriend said she believes all gods are real because when we give belief to something, it creates a reality on some Mm -hmm. I don't know if I agree with her on that or not. That reminds me of uh, Neil Gaiman's American Gods. I, I love Neil Gaiman. I, his best thing he ever wrote was Sandman. Oh, I love Sandman. But that idea of like what we honor becomes a god. So, you know, there's there's the god of media. There's the god of PR. There's the god of all these different things. Well, how but deeply yes, can we dive into this? Because we can dive into some... As deep as you want to go, go well, ahead. Let's go, let's go further. There's a concept in ritual magic called an egregore. Or also in Tibetan uh, Buddhism called... Um, a turpa, T-U-L-P-A. The idea is if enough people with enough power concentrate on something, they can make it into a reality, into something that manifests in reality that then takes on its own self-awareness, that takes on its own consciousness, and now becomes something separate from those who created it. Does that make sense? Totally. And we're sort of doing that with artificial intelligence. We're now creating something that is close to taking on its own awareness separate from us because we put our own effort into doing it. And so I'm drawing parallels between consciousness, uh, dating, selling, <laughs> uh, superheroes, and artificial intelligence. I'm an interesting dinner date. Yeah, I can tell. But I, but again, it's all that combination, what you're weaving together. You know, like last week's episode, we talked about the artist Lizzo and how she'll rap and sing and bounce all around the stage. And then she'll pull out a flute and just go to town on a flute. She's bringing in multiple things. And so you're combining all of these different parts, all of these different powers, for lack of a better term, in you. And I love that you're talking about in Batman Begins when, you know, about that idea of I am, a, I, right now I am a man, I am a person, but I can be an idea. And if you look at the Batman franchise and all of the different ways that that has gone, there have been 900,000 Batman, <laughs> but the bat signal lives on. The bat signal does not change. You put a bat in the sky and, in my and you opinion, know what that means. In my opinion, the actor who captured him the best was Christian Bale. Batman Begins, one of my all-time favorite movies. I've seen it 10 times. Yeah, it's so good. He and really I agree got with it. you. Christian Bale is excellent. You know what I like about his portrayal? He's a great Batman and a good Bruce Wayne. Yep. Mm -hmm. sometimes you get somebody who's really good at one or the other like michael keaton was a great bruce wayne in my yeah, it's a terrible batman exactly 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 but when you can find something that that brings it all together like christian bale does i just i love that but you know what is the bat signal yeah oh actually that's a great question hey paul if you were going to create a bat signal called the paul signal what shape would it be and what building would you put it on? What building would I put it on? Um, that's a good question. I don't know. I put it on the Empire State Building like Godzilla. Yeah. And it would look like this, like the cover of my book. Look how handsome I am. There we go. I love it. Uh, uh, I love uh. it. 
It's just a big picture of your book in the sky. You're like, I'm needed. Here I go. I'm needed. And I might have two cats, one on my left shoulder, one on my right, because I had two fur babies, two felines. Or rather, Cat man. Or rather, they have me. Yes. I was going to say, who's owning who in that relationship? Cat man. Cat man. <laughs> Dating, sales, all of it. I actually like I like Green Lantern. I have this ring that was specially made. Mm-hmm. This is number three. The first one got stolen. Second one, my ex girlfriend in Sweden has because she is a Green Lantern. Uh, and then I have this one. The, and to me, this represents the union of the will and the imagination. It's one thing mm-hmm. to have an imagination, but if you don't have will to bring it forth, it's just a bunch of fairy tales that you tell yourself. If you have will, but you have no imagination, then you're just going to be stuck with a lot of pushiness with no direction. Yeah. And it's also a so, good conversation piece. It's a good way of screening chicks. Chicks who recognize Green Lantern, get a pa- they get an automatic hall pass with me. I feel like my knowledge of Lord of the Rings helped me land my husband. So yeah. Really? How so? I'm going to turn this around. Uh, well, actually, okay, so this is a very long story, but I had, long story incredibly short, I had invited the guy I was dating before to a Lord of the Rings marathon that my friends throw every year that we actually just had this past weekend, our 10th annual, and he was such a dick about it, Paul. He was so mean, this guy I was dating, and all of my friends were like, no. And my friend Sean specifically told me that I was forbidden to do anything but date a Tolkien nerd who would appreciate a girl Tolkien appreciator. And I asked in my dating, my profile that I had up, what people are reading. My husband said that he's a huge Tolkien nerd and he's rereading The Hobbit. And so we just kicked off on this huge conversation about The Hobbit. And I, it, we had a Hobbit theme wedding about three years later. So, hey! Hey. Who do you yeah. think would win in a fight? Uh, Sauron with his one ring or Green Lantern with his ring? Man, does he have orcs? Is there an army involved? Because if it's just he Sauron. He has the Green Lantern Corps. No, no, no. I mean, does Sauron have an army? Sure. Okay, so it's Sauron and all of his orcs versus the entire Green Lantern Corps. Green Lantern I mean, the Corps. Green Lantern Corps would absolutely win. 100%. I think so, too. A hundred billion percent. You know why? Because Sauron's only thing that they have that Sauron has going for it is fear and domination. And Green Lantern knows exactly how to take on fear. The That's core right. has done it before. They do it all the time. They do it all over the world. That's I right. Love it. Now, who would win in a fight between Saruman and Batman? Um, Batman is has been shown that he can't be dominated by telepathy, and Batman is harnessed fear but on the other hand batman sauron is a mythical creature akin to a god and would be invulnerable to any attacks you would have to have someone on the level of thor to beat sauron but i love the way that you said that or though. dr strange dr strange that would, would whip his ass <laughs> send him to the, he would send him to the domain of dread dormammu i mean now we're getting too <laughs> geeky for the rest of the audience to understand and be interested <laughs> Okay, okay. But I love that final point that you left us. It's all about how you harness the fear, not about avoiding the fear, but about to use your word about blessing the fear, harnessing the fear and using the fear. Paul, you and I could talk for a million years, but I don't want to hog you. When our listeners (laughs) want to start a conversation with you, where can they find you? Well, uh, that's problematic. Because I'm a real busy dude. But I tell you what, I have my um, rapid sales accelerator training. It's absolutely free. What's interesting, what will be interesting to you guys, to the listeners, is the first, uh, you're going to get the first four chapters of my book for free. And that's entirely about mindset. Everything I've taught about mindset is in that first four chapters of my book. There's a 22 minute training on some principles of selling and then a P audio training. It's an audio training and then a PDF report about um, how to destroy objections. But I tell you what, let's add some urgency to this. I go through weekly to, uh, to see who's um, downloaded because you do have to give me my email address. Every week I select someone at random to get a free 15 minute consult with me. There's no selling, no pitching. I just will look at what you're doing and give you a little tweak to see um, if we can help out. 
but that's my encouragement because I do want people to download this. So Heck yes, hurry, hurry up, get in there and be one of the random people I select each week. Uh, and to get to get there, go to paulrossbook.com. Paul Ross. Just go to paulrossbook.com. Oh. And you get and just sign up for free for my rapid sales accelerator training. You guys in particular who's listening will love the mindset stuff. It's a big unpacking of what I've just touched on today. And again, once a week I, at random, I pick someone to have a 15 minute consult with me. That's freaking amazing. Everybody, I know that you have loved this episode with Paul. I've certainly loved this episode with Paul. I will be back in just a minute with my final thoughts and your homework for the week. Well, hey there, listeners. Paul and I really covered a lot of ground in this episode topic-wise. He has so much to share and such wide expertise. I don't even feel like I scratched the surface of his brain and it was still a whirlwind to interview him. I'm still unpacking all the gems he dropped for us. But one thing that really stuck with me is Paul's way of recognizing his challenges, but keeping them separate, distant from his identity. His magic recipe was to acknowledge, accept, and bless his challenges. I am blessed to joyously, creatively, courageously conquer the challenges in my life, is Paul's daily mantra. Again, I am blessed to joyously, creatively, courageously conquer the challenges in my life. The joyously part brings in strength, enthusiasm, and optimism. Your homework this week is twofold. First, to pen your own version of Paul's magical mantra made Mad Lib, I am blessed or your favorite synonym, whatever feels best, to adverb, 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 verb, the challenges in my life. My version of the moment is, I am fortunate to calmly, compassionately, and enthusiastically tackle the challenges in my life. What's yours? The second chunk of your homework is to normalize how freaking hard entrepreneurship can be. It may be a calling, but it often feels like a curse and a curse that nobody talks about. But it's par for the course. It's part of the journey. In our lowest moments, it's easy to feel totally alone, which hurts self-efficacy, creativity, and willpower. This week, I task you to have a candid conversation with a trusted member of your work fam about what obstacles you've tackled lately and where you could still use a boost. Ask for help if desired, but don't forget to listen and support your pal in turn. We are all joyously in this together. Too Legitimate to Quit is brought to you by the Non-Sleazy Sales Academy and me, Annie P. Ruggles. What if you never had to sell alone again? If you always felt safe and seen and supported in selling situations because you only had to show up as your best and also most ordinary self. You can profit just by being you without one gimmick, one inch of sleaze. To find out more about our membership, visit www.nonsleazy.com. That's N-O-N-S-L-E-A-Z-Y dot com. Too Legitimate to Quit is written and hosted by me, Annie Passanisi Ruggles. Our editor and producer is Andrew Sims of Hypable. Our incredible earworm of a theme tune was composed and performed by Riley Horbasio. Our beautiful show art is by Francois Vigno. And my beautiful, wonderful, amazing creative director, Georgia Curran, handles my social media accounts with care. Listen, I would love to hear from you. I'd love to hear how your homework is going, what you think of the show, or what topics you'd love to see covered here. Feel free to reach out to me on any platform with messaging, but the best for me are LinkedIn, where you'll find me under my name, Annie P. Ruggles, or on Instagram, where you'll find me at Anniepreneur. And please don't forget to send this show to people that you think would benefit or to drop us a review wherever you listen to podcasts that really helps our show grow. Until next week, remember, you're too legit to quit. <laughs>